Hi, this is Jim from RV4x40.com. Glad you could join us today. Our video is going to be about an upgrade we did to our battery system on our coach. And it's a very important issue because the batteries we had, while they worked okay, they were lead acid batteries, they were wet cell batteries, so-called golf cart batteries. And because they're wet cell, they required periodic maintenance of replacing water that evaporated out. And they also outgas corrosive gases which then corrode the terminals, the wiring, and other things that are in that battery compartment. Not the least of which, when I took the batteries out, was the shelf underneath, which was steel, but somewhat rusted by this point. So I had considered going to AGM batteries sometime back once these batteries reached the end of their life. AGMs have a benefit that you can discharge them further, and they will recharge faster. So they are a better battery system. They are about two to four times the price of the lead acid batteries that are in there depending on just which ones you buy, quality, manufacturing, what kind of price discounts you might find at some place online or otherwise. I thought about lithium batteries, but their price tag was still pretty doggone expensive by comparison. But I ran into the guys from Battleborn Battery at a RV rally in Wellington, Texas in the fall, got to know them, got to ask some very serious questions about their technology and how they did it and came away very impressed with what they were doing. And they were offering us discount, uh, not huge, but a small discount because of being at that rally. So I decided it was time to upgrade and replace the existing lead acid batteries. It wasn't really a particularly difficult challenge to do it. It just took some wiring and some other things. Maybe the hardest part was lifting out each of the 85 pound batteries that was in there. And there were four of those. The new batteries are about 30 pounds a piece. So I gained over 200 pounds of weight reduction on the coach, which was always a significant thing especially when our rear axle is very, very close to its maximum rated load anyway. So that was how we get, went about getting to make the decision. I will tell you this up front. It is an expensive upgrade if you look at just the initial outlay. However, these batteries are guaranteed for 10 years, which is about three times as long as you would expect to get out of a golf cart battery and maybe twice as long as you get out of an AGM. So they come with a long life expectancy of at least 3,000 cycles of discharge and full charge. And uh, the guys at Battleborn tell me they routinely get 5,000 cycles without too much trouble. So I'm anticipating these batteries will probably last longer than some other things on the coach that might need to be replaced as well. So the video will show you the before and after. It will show you the, the condition of the batteries and what we had to go through to take out the lead acid batteries. And then the uh, installation of the new uh, lithium ion batteries in their place. The wiring you'll see is all 2 aught gauge and it's uh, somewhat difficult to get the crimps on there correctly, but it can be done. And I encourage you, if you consider doing something like this, do not consider soldering those connections together. They really need to be a solidly done mechanical crimp. Solder does not work well for the kind of currents involved uh, with these, these systems. The reason for doing this was that while we don't boondock extensively, we do periodically uh, stop at a roadside park for the night because we're in a hurry to get somewhere. We have also boondocked out in the western states where there's a lot of federal land that you can camp on for a couple weeks uh, for free. No charges at all, so it makes a very economical place to go visit in that respect. And so we've done some of that. Our batteries we had uh, were capable of 400 amp hours by their rating. However, with a lead acid battery of that type, you can really only safely pull about half of the rated current before you start to degrade the life of the battery. And if you discharge them fully, you will really drastically reduce the life of that battery. So we were pretty careful to do that. We did exceed that maybe a couple of three times in the three years we've had this coach. But we were very careful to keep it uh, under the 200 amp hour point. And that would cover us overnight and for some time into the, e well, cover the evening and then overnight into the next day when either the solar array could kick in if we had sunshine. Worst case, uh, we could turn the generator on for an hour or two to, to recharge the batteries before the following night. So we'll show you what it looks like and we'll come back to you after you've had a chance to see all of that. Now the wind is still pretty hefty here. We're taking a look at the battery compartment on our 2007 Monaco. And on the right hand side over here you will see the two starting batteries. Those are maintenance free batteries. Uh, they're, they're still lead acid batteries, wet cells, uh, but they're the type that don't have to have water. Over here, we have six golf cart batteries. These happen to be from Sam's Club. They're Duracells. They're actually fairly good batteries, especially for the price. 
the, all together there's 400 amp hours worth of capacity there and you can see the heavy cabling which is used on all this stuff and uh, a few other things around in here there's a battery disconnect switch up there and another one up there for the for the batteries to disconnect them when you're when you're working on the whole system and so uh, these batteries are going to stay the same probably pretty much in the same position they, they could be rotated perhaps or moved a little bit but we're replacing the lead acid golf cart batteries the wet cells that do hey, require periodic maintenance they require water to be added on a, on a regular basis as you're charging them they do outgas so you have corrosion that occurs which affects the battery terminals of course and then it affects the other things uh, in this compartment as well so we have four battleborne batteries we'll be installing here once we get this stuff out and the battleborne batteries are a uh, lithium ferric uh, phosphate uh, technology which means that they are, are quite good they will charge faster they will discharge faster and instead of being limited to about 200 amp hours of actual discharge capacity which is what you can get by using a 50 percent limit on, on how far you discharge lead acid batteries for maximum life the battleborne batteries are rated for 100 percent discharge rate so instead of 200 amp hours of effective battery we'll have 400 amp hours of of battery capacity this is not something one does for cost uh, these batteries are still relatively expensive even with a fairly good price on them these days and prices are dropping but still the cheapest solution far and away is to use lead acid batteries but the lithium batteries are significantly lighter and they give you a full rated capacity discharge as opposed to 50 percent so it extends our ability to dry camp uh, without needing to run the generator or get a good a solar charge uh, to fix things up so we're looking forward to the improvement in being able to uh, being able to to dry camp longer without having some issues. So uh, we'll get started on removing the wiring and so forth because the first thing to do is to get these batteries out and uh, pull the wiring out so we can replace a lot of that. Uh, it will have to be rewired and recabled uh, for optimum use of the new batteries. So we'll kind of let the camera run for a little bit on this as we disconnect some of these things and, and take it all loose. And the first thing I want to do is disconnect the, uh, the battery system from the chargers. Uh, that being done, the next thing to do when you're dealing with batteries, if at all possible, is to remove the negative terminal so you don't accidentally ground uh, a hot wire to the chassis. In our case, I believe you can see it over here, this is the main negative terminal that goes to the shunt that measures the actual current flowing into or out of the battery bank. So we pull this one ground wire off and then everything is relatively safe at that point. These are still high current situations and you can, uh, if, if you get a piece of metal across the terminal, you can melt the metal, you can melt rings, you can cut off fingers from heat. There's all kinds of nasty things you can do. So it's always uh, good to be very safe. And I am wearing uh, safety glasses while, while I'm doing this. Uh, I won't be in front of the camera, I don't think, but I do have safety glasses on and we'll be working on figuring out how to uh, move all this stuff around and rewire it so that it becomes a more effective installation. Here's the battery compartment ready to reinstall batteries and I didn't take pictures of what it looked like it was pretty grody on the floor here a lot of corrosion a lot of rust so it took a little bit of time with uh, a wire brush to clean all of that out and then I put a couple of coats of rust reformer on it followed by a, a coat of flat black if you're not familiar with it There's the rust reformer, and uh, I'm sure there's other brands besides Rust-Oleum, but that happens to be the one easily to get at Home Depot. And the reformer is a process that will help convert the rust and, and stop it from rusting further and helps protect uh, a rusted surface. It's not a smooth finish, so if it's something which is cosmetic, you wouldn't do this. 
So we started with that. I had a couple of coats of that on there. And then just a plain old matte black finish to finish it up. The, not expecting to have as much of a problem with corrosion now because we won't have the, uh, the wet acid batteries in there. The two ignition, uh, new starter, the, uh, the two starter batteries for the coach are uh, maintenance free uh, lead acid batteries so they don't outgas anywhere near the way the, the uh, golf cart batteries did. So that should be a little bit better, all things considered. So we're about ready now to go in and start hooking things back up, get the batteries in and uh, get everything back where it's usable again. This is the final installation of the batteries after all the wiring is done. You can see that the batteries are oriented in two different directions. I found I really didn't have enough room to put the batteries in where the golf cart batteries have been and leave the batteries down flat like this. They could have been turned on end because they don't really care about their orientation with these particular batteries. But I felt the wiring was going to be harder to get to and to, to maintain and to work on and actually to install it. So I elected to use some of the room that I had, which would be wasted space otherwise. And this is the installation as it ended up. I would urge you, if you're going to look at doing this, to make sure you measure the dimensions carefully of the batteries and, and figure out how you're going to install them. It would be a shame to get the batteries there and then find out you really didn't have enough room because of the orientation or some other limitation on how you wanted to install the batteries. I found it to be a pretty simple process as far as that was concerned. Uh, the wiring is all 2 aught gauge uh, welding wiring, so it's very, very flexible wiring. Uh, you do need a crimp tool to crimp the connectors on properly. That is very important. And, and so if you don't have that or don't want to deal with this, of course, you can find someone to do the installation for you. But it does work out quite well. It's neater perhaps than the other one was, perhaps not, depending on your viewpoint. The wires are a little bit longer. But that's just the nature of how I chose to install the wires. Well, there you have the upgrade that we did. The question has been asked, you know, would I do it again? And the answer is absolutely yes. On the one hand, it was an expensive upgrade. On the other hand, I think it's greatly improved the ability we have to boondock and be off grid and run just on the solar and the batteries, uh, unless we need air conditioning. That's, that's something we can't do off the solar system. But without that, in a lot of places in the in the winter time. You can get decent amounts of sun to recharge batteries and not ever have to fire the generator up. So now when we boondock, we become limited by water and or the, the gray and black tank capacities we have and how long we just want to stay out in the desert before we need to come back and, and plug in for some other particular reason. So it's a good deal. The folks at Battleborn were easy to work with. Now we did have one problem in doing this whole upgrade, which was not so obvious when I started. And I talked to the folks at Battleboard about the uh, charger system we had, which is an inverter charger, as it's called. Uh, if you have shore power coming into the vehicle or the generator running, it will charge the batteries. Uh, if you don't have that, then it turns around and works as an inverter to take the 12 volt battery power you have in that battery bank and create 110 volt AC out of it to run things like TV sets, computer chargers, cell phone chargers, anything else that needs 110 volts to run. We can run the microwave easily off of the battery bank. It's, that's not a big deal. So we have that going on for us, but when I found out when we put the batteries in and hooked them up, the initial charge went fine. I basically set it up, decided it was charging okay, and promptly forgot about it. A couple of weeks later, the power in the RV park we were in went out, so we lost power in the middle of the night. And that's not particularly unusual. It does happen in different places at different times. But the inverter did not kick in, and it's set up. It should have automatically have started up. So when I started checking and I found that the battery bank was essentially completely discharged. We had, we had no power left in that battery bank at all. So while the charger had been turned on, it had been apparently working, something was amiss. We did start the generator up, had power for the rest of that night, and then power came back on the next day. So not a big deal. But as I researched this, I found that in my generation of Magnum Inverter, they have a feature that they allow the battery to rest after they've fully charged it and set it on float charge for a period of time. They turn off the charger completely. If you do that with a lead acid battery, then the battery voltage will decay from about 13 and a half volts, uh, depending where it was sitting at for charging. And it will, over a period of a couple of hours, discharge down to somewhere around 12.7, 12.6 volts. And the magnum inverter is set up to sense at 12.8 volts. When the battery gets down that far, it goes back into a charging cycle and repeats the whole charging cycle over again to make sure the battery stays charged. Well, the problem we have with that is, number one, is in my generation of Magnum Inverter, 
that number was not programmable. It was a fixed setting inside of the system. And secondly, the lithium batteries discharged down to about 13.1 volts, which is obviously significantly above 12.8 volts. And so while they charged initially, the batteries never kicked in and never charged after that point. I contacted uh, Battleborn, talked to them about this, and then talked to Magnum about the whole thing. And it turns out that the controller I had on my inverter charger system was capable of having the firmware upgraded for a fee uh, that would bring it up to speed. And they've uh, eliminated this, or not eliminated, they've changed this feature in later versions of the inverter I have to allow you to program whether you even go into that mode or whether what the voltages are that it triggers to come back out of it. So they've had enough issues with different battery systems. They fixed the problem, but my inverter could not be upgraded at all in terms of just software it actually took a new control board to be put into it. So that turned out to be one of the more difficult things to do. Not so much the installation of the, uh, of the control board itself, it was getting the inverter out from the wiring that held it in place far enough to get the cover off to get to the board to change it out. Once I did that, it really worked out quite well. Put that in and since then we have had no problems keeping the, uh, keeping the battery bank charged either off of shore power or off of the solar cells when we when we have daylight and, and sunshine to do that. So system is working well and I would definitely do it again. I would definitely recommend it. Uh, as far as cost is concerned, it is an expensive upgrade, but there's a payback for it in terms of life of the system after you install it. And your final cost is gonna depend upon how much work you can do personally, whether you're comfortable working with this kind of stuff and doing the heavy power cabling that's required to to replace, probably replace your cables. I had to replace mine to, to make them long enough to reach the new batteries. And so your, your costs can vary quite a bit depending on how much work you do yourself and where you are in the country. Anyway, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this short video about a major upgrade to our battery bank. Thanks to the folks at Battleborn for the technical support they've, they've given me and for making the batteries available. It's a good product and they're good people to work with. In the meantime, I hope you keep her between the ditches as you travel down the highway. Join us on the highways and byways of America. Because of the issue we had with the Magnum charger, and it's simply a matter of technology changing with the times, it's not anything particularly bad with what they did, it's just that uh, they couldn't anticipate all the possible outcomes in the future when they designed the system. And they were very helpful in terms of getting the thing uh, corrected and updated. It was not a big deal to do that, but it did take some extra cost and some extra time. But uh, in the end, it, it has all worked out very, very well. I'm going to insert a graph and it will show you the charge cycle that Magnum uses. Where it goes up, it goes to the bulk charge and it goes down. At the end, there's what they call a sleep stage. You can watch the curve go down. It's pretty well illustrated. When that curve drops down, what happens is the system, as originally designed, is waiting for the battery voltage to drop, and that parameter was not changeable. In other words, it's not field programmable for how long to wait. And in our case, what you can see very clearly, the point where it had to go down uh, in terms of battery voltage to trigger a new charge cycle was below the point that the lithium batteries were ever going to discharge to until they were more than completely dead and they have a they have a turn off system that keeps them from charging beyond their 100 percent point so i'm not sure you ever could get the voltage down to the point where it would trigger that thing no matter what it certainly didn't in our case so this curve kind of shows you what's going on if you have a different charger system in your coach and are concerned about it you might do some research on this particular topic in the case of magnum if you have a later generation control you have an ability to program that voltage so you could bring it up above the 13.1 volts and your system would work just perfectly fine. In our case, that's what we did when we had to uh, upgrade the inverter and the, the controller itself. So I hope that information helps. It might be useful to someone. If you're dealing with an issue trying to get lithium batteries to work with an older charger system that might have some peculiarities that weren't thought of at the time.